All right. I told you if you have any questions about body language, just email them to me and I'd answer them. And if you have a question about body language, just email it to me at bodylanguagequestions at gmail and I'll get right on it. All right, our first question, what is the difference in contempt and disgust? It's actually a pretty good question. Contempt and disgust look similar. Contempt is where you you feel like the person or thing you're looking at or situation um you may hate that person. You may dislike that, but you may think that person's mean or you don't like that situation because it hurts someone or that kind of thing. So you see that, that just part of your lip goes up like that. And you'll hear this. You'll hear people say contempt is the only asymmetric um, uh, facial expression. It isn't. There are a whole bunch of them. However, what they're, re what they're talking about is it's the only asymmetric or asymmetrical, um, facial expression in the seven universal facial expressions. What's discussed is this. It's when your nose wrinkles right here, this upper lip comes up. Sometimes you'll see teeth and all of a sudden, depending on the situation, it may look like a little smile on there, a little bit like, yeah, because it's gross or whatever and everybody smells at the same time. The blend of those looks like, mm, you may hate something or dislike something from um, because they're mean or whatever. And they may do something, they look kind of go, oof, oof. So as you move from one to the other, you'll see that blend in there. It won't just be click, click. You'll see you'll see both of them, but it's really tough to see both of them. You know what I mean? So you, so that's why sometimes it's confusing for you if you're if you're asking. A lot of people get confused on that, and that's fine. You know, because you're just figuring it out. But that should help, I hope. What is an example of someone using odd adapters, and what is the oddest adapter you've ever seen? Adapters are the things, are the um, repetitive movements and things we do to help get rid of that built up stress and tension. It could be something where we're squeezing our hand, we're pushing on our face. You're just trying to get, when you're in a stressful situation or something that's uncomfortable, you want to get rid of that built up stress and tension. Some people will chew on your mouth. Some people do this and they'll pull on their lip. Some people, I knew a guy would stick his finger up his pinky up his nose. <laughs> And some people is pulling their ear. They may push like this. You may see this. Oops. You may see them squeeze their arm, whatever it is. And those are ways of getting rid of that built up stress and tension. The oddest one, and you see some odd ones, but the oddest one I've ever seen was a video of me doing, uh, I guess, the oddest adapter I've ever seen. Here's what happened. There was, I, when I was a record producer, years ago um there was a record that i that i produced and the a and r guy the head of a and r I didn't like him at all he's like this is gonna go platinum i'm like it's not gonna go platinum dude there's no there's no way there's no way because this this kind of record nobody had um there they didn't sell a whole lot but i did the record anyway because i liked it and he said, yeah, it's going to go platinum. And then I said, no, dude, it's not going to go. And he said, oh, yeah, it is. I said, I'll bet you. And he says, oh, yeah, what do you want to bet? I said, if that thing goes platinum, and I gave him a certain amount of time, whatever the time was, I said, I'll shave my head. And whatever comes back, the first inch, I'll bleach it. And he said, what happens if I lose? And I said, if you lose, you owe me five grand. So he thought about it for a few minutes. He said, okay, we'll do it. You're on. If this thing goes platinum, that day you have to shave your head. I said, you got it. That's a bet. Confident. I was so confident with all that, right? Now, there's that. Then uh, there's the Beach Boys, right? And I had never worked with Beach Boys before, so I was going to produce a, uh, two tracks, one or two tracks on them for some record. And the day before they showed up, or no, it was not the day before. It was two months before they showed up. This record I'd done, and this album I'd done, went platinum. And I got the call, hey man, guess who's gonna be shaving their head? This is before he even got in Billboard. And I was like, oh no. He said, yeah. So there you go, I see you Monday. So I had to shave my head. And then whatever came back that first inch, I had to make blonde. I think it was two months out, it might've been three months out. Anyway, um, so I shaved my head, and let me tell you, when you have a big head like mine, oh, it was bad. It was real bad. I won't show you a picture of that, but it, it was bad. And 
I remember I looked like a a, um, a German curly, you know, like a big fat German curly, you know, from the Three Stooges. It was bad. And then when it started growing in, I had to wait till it was an inch. And the this guy came over and measured. He goes, "Okay." He came to the studio. He's like, "I see what you got." And so I had I bleached it. Went out and had it bleached. You talking about something looked bad? Imagine me bald number one, and then cut to uh, whatever's growing back has been bleached. And I realize after this happens that they've already booked me to work with the Beach Boys, right? Because you book those things a long time out. Sometimes, sometimes you. Saw, you know. So, man, I remember I was horrified. I was like, oh, no. The, I'm doing the bit. And I'm walking around. I'm big and fat. And I had this, I had this so bad. <clears throat> and then they show up, the Beach Boys, and we're working, right? <laughs> nice guys, great guys. I'd never met Brian Wilson before. I got to meet him and uh, hang out with him some. I got a story about him later on. I won't tell it here. Um <clears throat> But uh, great guy. And listen to me name dropping over here, Brian Wilson from the Beach Boy. But I'm telling you, as part of this story, I'm not trying to, like, hey, guess what? You know who you're running up? Sting. Nothing, I never met Sting. So I'm not name dropping, I'm just telling you a story. Because now that I'm, as I'm listening to this while I'm telling it. <laughs> anyway, so I should have just said a band. Anyway, where. But I was really excited, and we're working. And I thought everything was going smooth, you know. And then the engineer says to me, Lee, he goes, hey, man, what do you keep doing this for? What do you keep poking on your head for? I said, what are you talking about, man? He said, why do you keep doing this and touching your head in that same spot? Is it, is it hurting? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, for three days, that's all you've done is sit there and do that. I was so stressed because I knew I looked goofy in front of these people that I was just, I couldn't get, I couldn't put thinking about my hair. I was actually touching my hair and I would pull on it and pat on it and touch it. And I know that he told me that he said, yeah, there's uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to show up in these. And then uh, I think Warner brothers would come in and taking like video of them in the studio or whatever. And you see every time I show up, I'm sitting there patting on my head, pulling on my hair in this thing. Oh, it's horrible. So that's the oddest I've ever seen. The most odd adapter I've ever seen was my own. Is there such a thing as my as manic or psychotic eyes? <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure people have seen a lot of that. You wouldn't. Um, I don't think there's the the psychopathic stare which we've talked about before, but I don't think there's a specific um, look that has psychotic eyes or manic eyes. Maybe you. I mean, maybe from movies or something, you see somebody sit around looking like that. They look crazy. That maybe that's manic. You know, somebody's well, you know in a manic state. They they look kind of weird. But there's no no list of of manic eyes or psychotic eyes on anything I'm aware of. Uh, the corners of my lips hang down a lot in my baseline facial expression, and some people think I'm always frowning. Uh, does this mean I'm grumpy subconsciously? Or just some people just have the corners of their lips droop a lot. That that comes under resting face. Some people just have a bad resting face. You know, I knew this kid who looked like he was smiling all the time. He'd get in trouble and looked like he was smiling, and that would make it the whoever's getting after him it would be even worse. I remember one time uh, in class, and this was in high school, he got in trouble, and the whole time the teacher's like, "You think this funny?" And he's like, "No," and he wasn't smiling, smiling, but his face looked like he was smiling. It was the weirdest thing. I always just thought he was in a good mood. But he was, uh, I felt so sorry for him because I realized, you know, because at one point he actually, he teared up. He didn't like bawl and cry and stuff, but I, he, he teared up. But he still had that, that little, almost a little smile on his face and he couldn't help it, you know. And now that I know it years later, I know I, I should have said, hey, hang on a minute. You know, as a kid, you don't know you can step in and go, hey, listen, this, is, this isn't right. I wish I'd known now what I, wish I'd known them what I know now about that. But some people's faces like, for example, yours probably just droops down a little bit on the sides. That's totally fine. It's totally normal. Don't get to looking at yourself in the mirror and thinking there's something wrong with you. You're just looking for problems at that point, you know. Um, no, some people's faces just do that. And some people are just the opposite of yours, and that's fine. 
you know, so don't think you're bummed out subconsciously. You're not. I wouldn't think. I think you just, uh, that's the way your face is, your resting face. So what you might want to do is practice your resting face, which we've talked about on here before as well. How old were you when you first realized understanding body language could be a tool you could use every day? I remember the first time I saw somebody communicating without, and I wasn't supposed to know they were communicating about something completely different than what we were talking about. And here's what happened. I was a little kid and I'd get these, had these traps called have a heart traps and they're box traps. And you know, the little squirrel goes in or the chipmunk or the possum and the doors would shut like this. It wouldn't hurt them. And then you'd go over and look at them and let them go. Cause I wanted to see what squirrels and possums and things like that looked like up close. So I'd, I'd catch them. And then, uh, the, you know, you could lift the doors up a little thing and they run out, right? Keep them for maybe 30 minutes so I could, you know, study them <laughs> as a kid. And, uh, I started, I wanted to, I wanted to see a squirrel up close and I couldn't get any squirrels to come into the trap. So I started reading about what squirrels were attracted to. Speaking of squirrels. Hey buddy. I don't have any, anything over here, pal. I don't think. Nope. Um, they come in for peanuts. My wife does that. She's got these things are like pets. Hey, buddy, what are you doing? I wish I had a peanut for you. I think I'm kidding. What's up, pal? What are you doing? Hmm? Let me get you a peanut. Hang on a second. Put this back here. I'm going to get a peanut before he freaks out. Be right back. Oh, wait. Here's one. Here you go, pal. Watch this. Here, buddy, cow. Pal, come here. There it is. You got it. Come on. It's a camera. There you go. So anyway, this goes on all day long if you sit out here. Not that I don't like it. I do. I think they're adorable. They're sweet. But man, in the middle of something, let me start that. <laughs> Isn't that horrible? Shouldn't feel that way. I don't feel that way. I like them. I actually like it. Let me see a deer or a turkey here in a few minutes. They'll come down out of those woods. That's where the turkeys come from. I got a raccoon that comes down. Oh, I do. It's not me. It's my wife. She's in, it's not her pet or anything, but she just likes um, feeding all those things and making friends with them. <laughs> it's crazy. Okay. So anyway, I was trying to catch squirrels when they want to get to, because I was interested in, and there was this stuff called anise oil or anise oil, A-N-I-S-E. And that's, you put that on a little piece of bread and you put it in your trap and it smells like, it's like a really, really uh, pungent and smelly uh, licorice, you know, and, and, and it goes, once you, it goes everywhere. And it's really, uh, it doesn't, if you smell too much of it, it's one of those things where it stinks, you know, because it's, 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 there's so much of it. But so I just read that. I didn't say, I didn't say the name out loud or anything. And I told my mom, I said, Hey, mom, can you take me down to the pharmacy? Because you, you don't get this at a drugstore at the time. Right. And I don't know what, what the reason was you can only get it there. I mean, you may just be able to get it there now. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so we go down to the drugstore and I walk in and I go to the back where the pharmacist is. And I said, and he said, Hey, right. Can I help you? And I said, yeah. And he said, what do you need? And I said, I need some anus oil. He said, do what? I said, I need some anus oil. He said, how do you spell that? And I said, A-N-I-S-E. He said, oh. Then he goes like this. He goes, hey, Linda, did you come here a minute? Without stopping looking at me. Did you come here just a minute? And then Linda came over, this woman named Linda, apparently. And she said, yeah. And he goes, he looked, it never stopped looking at me. He said, tell her what you need. And I told her, I said, I need some anus oil. And she goes, really? And I said, yeah. She said, how do you spell that? <laughs> I said, a N I S E. She said, Oh, anise oil. Yeah. Well, I, let me get you this. So it comes like a little bottle. So then I remember later thinking about that and thinking this guy was, was telling that woman something was up by the way he was acting. 
you know. So I thought that was fascinating. It was just one of those little things. Hey, buddy, I don't have any more peanuts. And uh, so I, I thought that was really funny. That's the first time I remember something happening where I wasn't aware there was another conversation happening uh, at the same time. You know, you want to see a chipmunk? Hey, really? You want one of these? I see you down there. Watch this. Here's a chipmunk. Huh? <laughs> That's all you get, pal. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, let me scoot this forward a little bit. So that's the first time I actually had something, uh, realized there was a conversation going on I wasn't aware of that was in bo with body language. I've heard psychopaths are missing the part of the brain that allows them to have empathy, which is why they're often able to do such terrible things. But why do they do the terrible things if they don't understand how painful it is for people? Um, well, we're talking about that. That's you're dealing with the amygdala, and a lot of times when you when you talk about psychopathy and and how you become a psychopath or what makes one, it's the easiest way to say is the amygdala are missing or damaged or not they're not functioning properly. That's the route I'll, I I take most of the time because that is the easiest way to explain that. Let's go a little bit deeper though, okay? When you when it comes to the brain and the limbic system and psychopathy. You're dealing with not just the, um, the limbic system as far as the amygdala goes, okay? There's a lot more to it than that. A lot more happens with the brain when it comes to psychopathy, not just damage to the amygdala. There are other, you have the, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobes, you have all kinds of things that, that go on in the brain, and these things aren't connecting properly. So it's easy to say, ah, it's the problem with the amygdala. They're missing their damage. They're not working properly. That's the easiest, quickest way to get to it, to get to someone who's not into the, the technical and clinical speak of uh, body language and human behavior. And the, the neurological side of it is, for me, it's fascinating. It may be fascinating for you, but for most people who are, who come to, who, that I talk to about this, and they want to know about that. They want to know how to see if somebody on TV's live, if somebody on their true crime show's live. That's what I'm, I'm, talking about that's why i like to make it simple that's most people want to understand that because it's a hobby and then you ask well, why do they do terrible things if they don't understand how painful it is for people because they're doing things to please themselves and seeing fear is one of the only the only uh facial expressions they recognize they see that and go yeah i know what that is and they do terrible things because they can do terrible things. it'd be like you when you go play if you were to play a video game and you were you know shooting people or ducks or squishing the insects inside that video game means nothing to you. Same feeling. They have the same feeling. It doesn't do anything to them at all because they don't have that equipment that, that we're talking about. So if we look at the brain's machine, the parts of the, of the brain aren't in there that enable them to feel those things. You know, they can get mad. They feel anger, but they can't feel, they don't feel empathy because they can't feel empathy. They don't have the equipment in there that allows them to do that. So that, that's why. Can the punishment question actually mislead you? Would many adults not purposely choose the worst punish, punishment in order to seem innocent? The punishment question is this. You ask that person who's, who is in trouble or might be in trouble, you ask them what should happen to the person that did whatever it is. You want to ask them what they think should happen to the person that's been doing this. What do you think should happen to the person that took that money? What do you think should happen to the person that you know, that hurt this other person, the person that um, set the car on fire. What do you think should happen to them? Quite often, not every time, but quite often the person who did it will say, well, you know, they, they need they need help. That person needs help. They should, you know, talk to a therapist. And, and they'll do all these things, but say, no, what they should say is they should go to jail. They should go to prison. That's illegal. It's, it almost killed somebody doing that. Or stealing all that stuff, that's not good, man, because it makes all of us look bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not into this at all. You know, that's the answer you want. But when you, but what you're asking is this, why wouldn't you give that answer? You just go ahead and say that because they don't know what you know. You've been exposed to these things where you know what, what to do when that happens. You know, the questions to ask now, see, this may be your hobby is body language and behavior. Look what you've learned. Yeah. So 
this is actually a little sign for you that you've done well, that you're learning. Because you're like, then why wouldn't somebody ask the, because they don't know to, to, to give the, the worst answer possible. They don't think about that. Hey, buddy, I just threw a whole bunch of them right there. There you go. Where'd he go? There he is. Anyway. I won't do this outside anymore. <laughs> That's too much going on. All right. What are some good body language tips for being a good interviewer or host? That's good. Um, I don't host a lot of things. I do interview people a lot. <laughs> but it's a different style of interviewer, of interviewing. Uh, well, the, the best thing to do is don't be emotionally constipated. Be yourself. Talk like you talk, act like you act. Because the more you are relaxed, the more that person, because they're going to be a little bit nervous being there. If it's a um, your podcast or YouTube show or something, your channel or something, a YouTube episode, where you're talking to someone, just act normal. The more people talk like themselves, the less it seems like there's an interview going on, and the more it seems like you're just talking. That's what you want. You, just want, you want that authentic uh, connection between people. Hey, quit goofing around. Y'all quit horsing around. Somebody's going to get hurt. <laughs> Those bluebirds, man. They're crazy. There's some right over here, man. You can say that. Nice hand. To get, they'll come over. Um, I, mean, I can't concentrate. This is me. Things running around over here. It's, I can't think. There's a bunch of people going to be mad at you. Man, you, you're too cute. Come here, mate, you sweet little thing. How the heck, I don't have anything to give you. I've already given it up. Oh, my gosh. He's adorable. Hello there. I wish I had something for you, pal. Look at this. You see him in there? Come here, mate. All right, if you have any questions about body language, just email them to me, and I'll answer them. Body language questions at gmail.com.